am Priscilla. I'm Renata. I'm Paula. We've come all the way from Brazil to unravel the mysteries of the Australian wines. Let us take you on a tour and discover what's behind these famous labels. Come on! Hi guys, we are here in the beautiful Barossa Valley and we're going to show you the place where, where I'm working for. Yeah, we have here a special guest today. She came from South Africa and she's a winemaker. Her name is? Brianna. Hi. Hi. Guys, let's uh, find out what's behind the Hickley Farm label. Let's go! Let's go! Hey everyone, and welcome to the second season of Wonderful. This first episode, we have got a beast in store for you. Literally. We're at Hentley Farm, one of the most luxurious wine labels in Barossa, and we're talking about their famous wine, The Beast. And we've got a dirty little secret. We brought along a winemaker, just to keep them honest. So stay tuned and let's find out what's behind the Hentley Farm label. I would like to introduce you all, Andrew Queen, the winemaker since 2008. So Andrew, can you start with the history of Hentley Farm? So I guess the history of Hentley Farm itself starts with Keith Hinchke, who's still um, part owner and the, the uh, CEO here at Hentley Farm. So he spent a lot of time sort of in the mid 90s when he was working for a company called Orlando, a little oh, business just down in Rowland Flat you might have heard of, just, just little. Um, yeah, and so his idea was he wanted to start his own brand. And so he talked to a lot of winemakers and viticulturalists in the Barossa back in the mid 90s about what they thought would be the best sort of subregion of the Barossa. And the majority of them spoke about this sort of northwestern edge, Granite Creek that's just outside the window here and, and the red clay loam soils that are on, on the banks of, of Granite Creek. So he spent a lot of time sort of on the weekends driving around the Barossa looking for a property that sort of out on this edge that would suit um, the development. So that you ended up finding this place in 97, um, planted the vineyard in 99 and it sort of moved forward from there. You buy from other growers as well? So I guess what we're most well known for is certainly our estate produced products. So we have this vineyard that Keith set up that's about 40 hectares. Um, and we produce our estate products that start with the white label that you can see behind us. So this is um, our estate, what we call our estate range, which is sort of a blend of the property. And it goes from there up um, in terms of all the way up to Beast and Beauty and, and Cloato. So they're all just purely produced off this estate. So from the white label up. We're known for the estate stuff, but we, we play around with regional blends as well. Oh, that's amazing. I like this name. It's like, it looks strong. So. <laughs> yeah, so the Beast name, uh, well before I came along, obviously, but um, I think the story really is that Keith was just sitting around tasting this wine they had in barrel with a few mates and one of the mates who I think might have been Reed Boswood who's the winemaker over at Kaysler and was helping Keith um, back in the day said oh wow this is a beast wow. that <laughs> well, that's a really good name yeah it's that simple yeah and the beauty. the beauty came the next year I think that that was probably pretty yeah. pretty straightforward <laughs> uh, although I think Keith thought at the time or was told by some that the Beauty and the Beast was maybe a little bit corny and he shouldn't do it, so thankfully he didn't listen to that feedback. Yeah. Yeah. The names work so well for us, people remember the Beauty and the Beast probably more than they remember the name Hentley Farm. Yeah. I think. So, Hi guys, we are here in the Beastie Vineyards with Andrew Queen. We're certainly not organically certified, but we use, I guess, a lot of what are organic practices and I, I sort of use the word sustainable. We try to be as sustainable as we can with the way that we manage the soils particularly. So minimal tillage, so we're not trying to uh, turn the soil too often. Um, we do do one herbicide pass a year, but only that one just before bud burst in spring. Uh, and so as you can see behind us, letting grasses grow underneath the vines is something that we believe in. I, I think soil is meant to have stuff growing in it, believe yep, it or not. Yep. <laughs> and so that's a practice we use. It can be a challenge early in the season in terms of competition for water, but the grasses that grow tend to dry off at this point in, in the year. And actually they end up being a sort of a natural mulch layer that helps us retain moisture in the soil. Um, and so, and then obviously adding back organic matter as those grasses are breaking down through the winter yeah. period. So, and then what particular vineyards? What type of the soil we have? Here? Yeah, red, soil? shallow soil. Yeah, so we've got this beautiful red clay loam soil behind us. Um, it's only about 25 to 30 centimeters on the top horizon. Oh, shallow, yeah. Yeah, before it then hits this sort of shattered limestone underneath. So, yeah, quite a harsh environment up mm -hmm. here. We're up on the western hillside, so we get that early morning sun. Yeah, it sits up above the creek, so up above the little valley that we've got here. So warmer temperatures than some of the blocks down in the creek so yeah so the beauty comes from the top of the hill yep. it's more shallow soil more concentration grapes and the beauty comes from right down <laughs> near the cellar door so down near the creek so and the of the yeah hill. and so what tends to happen here is we uh, as you would in most cases you get the cooler air in the evening settling down yeah. into the creek 
and you've got those beautiful big gum trees down there that sort of trap it yeah. and also a hill on the eastern side that could provide some shade in the morning so it's generally two or three degrees at the start of the morning cooler down there in the beauty block than it is up here on, on the beast slope soil is a factor so more soil more, more depth of soil down there but also it's bluestone at depth rather than limestone so the okay. subsoil changes right. and so we tend to see the beauty block down in the creek is much softer town and more blue fruits and florals mm -hmm. where up here it's sort of bigger tannin and more dark rich fruit and my approach from a from a winemaking perspective is to try and highlight those characters with yeah. winemaking so we don't make the beauty and the beast exactly the same we use winemaking techniques to try yeah. and highlight the natural characters of those blocks and therefore hopefully really tell the story in the glass yeah. this is whether the term uh, you, you hear a lot being thrown around this terroir and um, yes. provenance yes and so definitely this is a different aspect than the the beauty and you can see it in the wine as well but then also as a winemaker you put your own take on right. how to better express those yes yeah so, and wow. i'm just a big believer that when you t two wines that are grown 300 meters apart they are different terroirs for sure but yeah. i really want to tell that story in the glass and so it's about using those techniques to increase the point of difference and, and tell that story yeah so this is the beast one of the wines that we're most well known for um it's probably our most I guess classic Barossa Shiraz, so um, yeah, a, a quite a big rich style and um, we do lots of um, tannin extraction during fermentation, um, we use about 65% new French oak, so um, lots of dark fruit, lots of rich fruit, um, but still looking uh, for f some freshness and vibrancy um, in the style. And you can tell for the nose, wow. <laughs> yeah. it's quite intense, sure. yeah. it's like it's a, a, like a color, like yeah. a lot, like to age you feel enjoy that? I can't take too much credit for the colour. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd have to be doing, doing something pretty wrong to not get that sort of colour because out on these soils with, with this sort of climate mm -hmm. and with Shiraz, colour just yeah. comes naturally. Yeah, Shiraz yeah. is very giving yeah. with its colour. It is, yeah. yeah. You don't have to work that hard at all. So you said like some skin contact and stuff on this as well. Sure. So do you yep. pre-impose? No, it so it generally skin? stays on skins for about 12 days, give or take. Okay. Um, we won't press this until it's well and truly gone yeah. um, dry. dry. Yeah. Not sugar dry, but certainly zero bromate. Yeah. So we're looking for that sugar to drop out. Mm. Um, some of our wines will do all of our pump overs and extraction very early, yep. but with the beast we work the cap the whole way all through time. and, and then press quite hard. So yeah, looking to extract as much of that tannin as we can. Um, the quality of the tannins out here on these red soils are really high and so you'll hear winemakers sometimes talk about over extraction. We extract yeah. as hard as we can. You can't <laughs> over-extract this wine. The all of those tannins are such beautiful um, ripeness and roundness yeah, and subtlety. Yeah, they are so, so soft and yeah. subtle. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. quite juicy, mm. no yeah. dry no. tannin, beautiful fruit. So the tannins aren't overpowering this at all. I think it's such a... And then when you're talking about these wines, actually for the people coming to visit us, it's pretty much like there's always people just telling, oh my God, the BC just is so coming everywhere, but yes. at the same time it's so it's smooth, like it's yeah. not anything uh, like aggressive at all. No, yeah. so you think beast, it has to be aggressive or something, but it's actually, I think the beast is it's just that so... You, like, yeah, it's yeah. intense, but it's, it's intense, nice. it's intense, it's rich, you have a lot of flavors, but it's nothing aggressive at all. It just, everything's coming round and in your palate. Mm. I still think it's like a very full body, like yeah. you still have a lot of things going on in your palate and it could like stunning amount, but it's just the tannins is so round and texture. If a wine's balanced when it's young, it'll be balanced when yeah. it's old. I share yeah. that view. Yeah. yeah, so if you've got the colour, which you can see, you've got the tannin, you've got that acidity, then it can be balanced, but still have that capacity to sit in the bottle for that's however long, as long as it's yeah. salad. Yeah. So really that's well, where you talk so. about the fine wines, right? So the fine wines you, you can drinking now because it's well balanced, yeah. but yeah. we can actually have potential for aging for long. You have that long yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, and we think of this as a 20, 20 plus year kind of prospect if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But it's also a wine that, as you guys are seeing, it's very soft and round and subtle when it's young. So you can drink it now, yeah. or if you've got the right cellar, put it down and, and look at it. In a yeah. But you need to understand how wines develop as well. Yeah. I think sometimes people think that if they haven't drunk mm. lots of old wine, that they'll put this down in the cellar and it'll look like this, but just oh, yeah. better. No. But it won't. It no. will evolve and look very different, and yeah. it'll be yeah. very cool, and it'll be more complete and more balanced and have lots of um, tertiary, tertiary flavours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it won't be this and better. It'll no. be very no. different prospects. Yeah. So. Aging wines is not for everyone. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so sure. it's depending how you like your wines. If you like Complexity. Yeah, if you like the complexity, if you want to like it more about the tertiary, you enjoy that. Beautiful for yeah. aging, but I think it, it's beautiful for drinking. I, I was yeah, going to say, it's like it's just a round yeah. one. If, if people like they're testing the wine and they like the wine now, have it now. 
Don't don't leave it unless you know you want to have it later on. If you buy six or twelve bottles, yes. yeah, yeah. So drink, can open one every half. year, every yeah, two yeah. years, and you get a feel for how it's Absolutely. developing. Yeah. And then you work out what age you want to drink wines yeah. at because yeah. everyone's different. Cheers, Cheers guys. Cheers. 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 Do you know what else is wonderful? If you hit the like in this video and subscribe to our channel. Cheers, guys.